Good evening and welcome everyone to our third event of this semester's GCC keynote lecture series. I'm going to share the presentation again uh, in one second, but I thought it would be best to have all of our faces here uh, seen first when we make a couple of notes of introduction. My name is Jens Kugele. I'm head of research coordination and member of the executive board at our center GCSC. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation during the next hour and a half on the fusion of techne, technology and thinking and on the tools, protocols and formats of our daily work as scholars, specifically the textual writing formats that we are used to use in our daily work. I'm looking forward to learning from our esteemed guest speaker, Professor Marcello Vitali Rosati, about his perspective on these topics. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Marcello, and for joining us tonight. Many thanks also to all of you in the audience for taking the time tonight to tune in. We look forward to hearing your thoughts and comments during the Q&A session. And most of you in the audience already know that during this um, current winter semester, our traditional GCC keynote lecture series continues its focus from the summer term on the role of the digital in the study of culture. We aim to shed light on the various potentials, the horizons, as well as the challenges in our exchange with experts in the field. And we're interested in a variety of interdisciplinary contexts and dimensions, such as the digital as an object of research and the study of culture, but also questions of archiving, digital research methods, consequences of the increasing digital culture for higher education teaching, legal aspects, open access, and more generally open science, university policy, data protection, and further socio-political dimensions. As in the previous semester, we attempt to make all of these events in this series as dialogue-based, multi-voiced, and dynamic as possible. And we started our conversation on the role of the digital in the study of culture in April, with a lecture by Martin E. from Burbeck University London over open access publishing in the humanities. We continued the series with reflections by Professor Eric Bourne from Cornell University on technology, infrastructure and digitalization in the context of critical university studies. In June, Professor Dorothy Birke's lecture introduced us to the topic of digital reading culture and specifically the phenomenon of booktube. In July, then um, Dr. Annette Löseke from Bard College Berlin and Professor Katharina Lorenz from JLU Gießen shared with us some of the findings of their collaborative research on curating cultural heritage in the digital realm. And in November, Professor David Lyons' lecture on his um, book, Pandemic Surveillance, marked the beginning of this semester's second part of the lecture series, followed by Professor Astrid Enslin's talk on video gaming and digital culture studies. And I'm thrilled, as we are all here on the panel tonight, that we have the chance to engage in a conversation with yet another inspiring culture studies scholar in the context of our lecture series, Professor Marcello Vitali Rosati from the University of Montreal, Canada. Just a brief note on the format of tonight's event before we proceed. Um, I have the privilege of being joined today by one more panelist, Marie Christine Boucher, one of the doctoral researchers at our center will share some comments and questions and will help me transition our conversation into a general discussion after the lecture, where we will then invite questions and comments from all of you in the audience. In the context of this lecture series, we are using WebEx events instead of WebEx meetings, and this is mainly due to the high standard of data right protection and WebEx events guarantees them on a different level. And as you have noticed, um, upon joining WebEx event, all members in the audience have their cameras switched off the microphones muted. Um, but to make uh, tonight's exchange as personal and interactive as possible, we decided to assign panelist privileges to everyone in the audience right after the lecture part. This will allow you to then switch on your camera and or unmute your mic. And it will thus create a bit more, as we think, a meeting atmosphere um, during our discussion. And during the Q&A, if you would like to pose a question or make a comment, please just enter a plus in the chat and we will be happy to add you to the list. However, if you prefer to, you may also just write out your question or comment directly in the chat and we'll be happy to read it out. Tonight's event will be um, recorded. The recording, however, is limited to the audio and video of our panelists and the recording does not include 
chat activity or any metadata regarding the participants of the set session. I would like to take this opportunity to express my thanks again to my colleague Marie-Christine Boucher for her, first of all, initial suggestion to invite Professor Vitali Rosati, whose work is connected to her own research, um, but also for her help in co-conceptualizing this event and for introducing our speaker. And with that, I'm happy to hand over to you, Marie-Christine. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Professor um, Marcello Vitali Rosati is a professor uh, at the Department of uh, Francophone Literatures, I suppose I would translate it, at the University of Montreal and holds the um, Canada Research Chair in Digital Textualities. Um, so in this role, amongst other things, he has developed platforms for publishing online journals and monographs and um, software for editing scientific article, which I think he will be uh, presenting today, um, Stylo. Um, his research deals with issues and challenges of digital technology, um, such as the concept of the virtual digital identity, the notions of author and authority, forms of production, um, the theory of, of editorialization, and, and more. Um, he is editor of uh, Sens Public, an international interdisciplinary journal, um, online journal, and also co-director of the book series um, Parcours Numérique, also um, on a similar uh, topic, I believe. Um, and this uh, invitation came about, as Jens already mentioned, um, I think, um, so the Unculture editorial team, which I was a, a part of until recently, uh, we were planning to invite speakers for this series on the role of the digital and the study of culture and uh, being an open access journal who um, we were very interested uh, in these questions of open versus proprietary, proprietary platforms and formats. Um, I think also being sort of in between as an open access journal, but still being in this uh, uh, part of this editorial um, workflow where we still depend a lot on proprietary software. So we were interested in, in those questions and around the same time, um, uh, Professor uh, Vitali Rosati and his colleague, Professor Michael Sinatra, who I believe um, is in is in, the, in with us tonight, um, so we're very pleased for that as well. Um, wrote an open letter addressed to uh, uh, in a in a local newspaper in Montreal, addressed to university administrators um, that was criticizing the uh, massive move to proprietary online platforms and spaces. Um, that happened to deal with the uh, digital needs in the wake of the pandemic, um, which caught our attention. And uh, in the end, our discussions for this lecture went into a different directions, but we are uh, nonetheless very glad to have him tonight uh, inside of our own university provided commercially owned online space um, to talk about something a little bit different. So thank you for being with us tonight and speaking. Thank you very much, uh, Marie-Christine. Uh, thank you, uh, Jens. Thank you uh, for the invitation and uh, for the presentation. I'm very happy to know that uh, uh, this letter, uh, who, uh, but which had no impact <laughs> on uh, on institutions, uh, but uh, at least uh, it had an impact on our reflection and your uh, your uh, reflection. So. Um, I will uh, start with uh, um, with um, the takeover uh, message uh, of uh, of this lecture uh, in order for you to be able to leave immediately um, after uh, one minute if uh, and uh, uh, or to sleep. Uh, so the, the the idea, the main idea, of what I'm going to say is that um, protocols, algorithms, formats and more generally uh, material arrangements, uh, material environment are our thinking. So I want to stress, they are not just conditioning our thinking, they are our thinking. This is the point uh, that I would like to, uh, uh, to prove. Uh, so uh, next slide, uh, please, uh, Jens. Um, so, the point is to stress this very relationship and probably this identity uh, between matter and thinking. And in order to do that, I will start with an anecdote. You will see uh, there will be many anecdotes in my, in my lecture. Uh, so in response to a, a blog post where I was trying to explain the importance of formats and writing tools, a colleague tweets 
and you can uh, uh, next uh, uh, slide yet another who instead of working uh, wasted his time playing uh, with latic so uh, th this was the point, and uh, it is interesting to analyze the point of view be behind uh, such reaction. So I was uh, uh, telling you about my uh, my uh, post, my my blog post, and uh, this answer of, of my colleague uh, on Twitter. So yet another another who instead of working wastes his time playing with LaTeX, and it's very interesting to analyze this um, because it is really rooted. Uh, it's, it's it's a way of thinking which is strongly uh, rooted in our culture, and we could say that such an idea is in continuity with uh, a certain interpretation of the famous uh, platonic uh, criticism of writing uh, that uh, we can find in the Phaedrus. Uh, Plato's position on this subject has been the focus of several uh, debates and uh, uh, the most famous uh, that you will certainly know is uh, um, uh, Derrida's uh, in La Pharmacie de Platon. If you read uh, Plato in the first degree, we identify an opposition between the ideality of thought of thinking on the one side, and on the other side, the impurity of its material inscription. So on the one hand, there is what really counts, uh, the content, uh, the ideas, uh, uh, whose, purest, whose purest expression is the logos. So that could pose certain questions because uh, logos is also the voice, so the voice is also a, a sort of inscription, or it is material, but it doesn't seem like that in in uh, in the Phaedrus. So on the other hand, the material inscription of these ideas and this uh, thought, uh, which represents a form of decay, the superior purity of thought is transformed into a byproduct, product, a bastard. This is the word used by Plato. Uh, in a product which is imperfect because it is embodied. So writing is this bastard product. And so it is the traditional uh, opposition between form and matter uh, where the latter is always a limited and imperfect manifestation of the format of the former. And uh, I want to stress that this um, this opposition is also revealed in a strong way, in a very strong way. And I will talk about that in the opposition between genders as uh, uh, masculine and feminine. And you can find it in Aristotle, and in particular in the, his treaty about the reproduction of animals, where he uh, uh, clearly states that uh, um, so the, uh, the, uh, uh, the form, mm, uh, the principle of movement, so the important part uh, of, uh, in the reproduction of animal uh, is uh, the sperm, so the male, principle and the female principle, uh, so the, the egg, is just uh, something to feed the, uh, the sperm. So uh, women just give the, uh, the uh, matter, which doesn't matter. We will come to this relationship between matter, uh, which matters or which doesn't matter. So in this case, matter doesn't really matter because uh, it's just food for an essence which will, uh, in any case, develop itself in the same way. Um, uh, so yes, it is important to eat, but what we eat, we, we used to think that does not uh, um, structure our very essence. Uh, it's just food. So uh, and it's very, very important, this point, because we will find it in the, uh, in the following um, considerations. So next slide, uh, please. And I hope that I will stay uh, connected. So um, a, a, an anecdote, another anecdote, a little, a, a little uh, uh, older than mine, it's uh, a Porphyrian anecdote which clearly manifests this ideology. In the life of Plotinus, so Porphyry is uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, um, so uh, Plotinus is the master of, of uh, Porphyry. Uh, so um, Porphyry tells how Plotinus wrote his Henneads, so his, his, very, his most important uh, work, while he was doing something else. So he was talking with other people, he was busy with other matters, and at the same time, he was writing down the complex thoughts that he had already developed. So the act of inscribing his thought on a medium was considered, was considered trivial. It had no importance in itself and therefore no particular dignity. It is manual work, 
which could eventually be delegated to an individual without any skills and any competencies, uh, who just mechanically transcribe what has already been de developed. So to quote uh, other conversation that took place uh, uh, around my, my, my uh, blog post, so the relationship between Plotinus and, and my blog post is very strong, um, somebody, uh, somebody uh, told me that uh, uh, the, the, the work of formatting and tagging the contents should be left to a secretary. So uh, this was in French, so uh, it, it was gendered and it was une secretaire, so uh, a female secretary. Um, so very interesting to stress how this um, has uh, Margot Mele, uh, who works with me, call it uh, little hands uh, work, uh, seems to be uh, really without any importance. It's just uh, just trivial work. There is no thinking in it. Next uh, slide, and uh, you have a long citation of uh, of uh, this uh, passage of uh, Porphyry. So I myself, Porphyry of Tyre, was one of Plotinus' very closest friends, and it was to me uh, he entrusted the task of revising his writings. So such revis revision was necessary because Plot Plot Plotinus could not bear to go back on his work, even for one rereading. So uh, this was in part because uh, uh, the condition of his sites, but it was also, and I won't read all the uh, citation, my slides are online um, any, uh, anyway, so if you want to check them, uh, they are uh, available. Uh, we can probably um, post the link on the chat. So. Um, uh, the point is, it was he was not interested to it work. It was not an important uh, work. So next slide, please, and we will talk especially about the relationship between women and computers. Here you can see a photograph of the Gallerates lab of uh, uh, Padre Busa. Father Busa. Uh, so uh, Roberto Busa is uh, um, uh, the the one. Often uh, we refer to Roberto Buse and uh, his work uh, as the beginning of digital humanities. So it was at the end of the 40s, beginning of the uh, uh, 50s, uh, and uh, um, Father Buse decided to uh, digitize, uh, so to put in, uh, in uh, uh, um, punch cards uh, all the work of uh, Thomas Aquinas. And actually this, uh, this work was uh, uh, mostly, and quite exclusively done by women. So no, no one of uh, the names of these women um, are available today. Melissa Terras, if you uh, click on the next slide, uh, just uh, uh, to give you some names. So uh, Melissa Terras uh, wrote a blog post where she tried to identify uh, these women. It's, uh, the, the photograph is really interesting. So you have a bunch of men, uh, who are just looking, so to look is the noble uh, attitude, the, the, uh, the good thing to do. Theory is about looking. And on the other hand, you have just one person who is actually working and uh, she's, she's a woman, but it was considered like just a secretary work. Uh, you just have to punch cards. So there's nothing involved in it in, from a theoretical point of view. Um, so it's, it's uh, really significant that in the history of computer, technical tasks have traditionally been left to women uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, actually with the idea that it is not important. Isabel Collet, that uh, you can, uh, you can uh, see the title of uh, one of uh, her contributions uh, on this topic, um, explained how at some point, so women who were so present and so important in, uh, uh, in the work of uh, uh, information technologies uh, just disappeared during uh, the 80s and the 90s just when the uh, the uh, perception of uh, information technology shifts uh, to something valuable for to something which uh, which a symbolic value and uh, uh, and immaterial so in the 80s we start talking about uh, inform about computers uh, associating them with the term virtual uh, so linking them with immateriality with symbolic value and the figure of hackers uh, emerges uh, which and uh, as uh, you know uh, hackers as are mostly not exclusively but mostly in the collective imaginary uh, men 
so that that's uh, very uh, interesting uh, to stress. Next slide, please. So um, this dualistic ideology that sees a clear separation between form and matter, so uh, uh, content, thoughts, uh, ideas, uh, things that matter on one side and matter which doesn't matter on the other side, has a long history, and it has been the object of several ana analysis and criticism. Um, so Derrida's is the best known. I was citing Derrida's La Pharmacie de Platon at the beginning. So it is a study of, uh, of uh, uh, Plato's Phaedrus. So it's very interesting, starting from the dialogue, the Plato's dialogue, who uh, was setting up this uh, metaphysics of uh, of uh, um, do of. Uh, of immateriality, you can call it. So Derrida speak about metaphysics of presence, but actually uh, the other point is the relationship between materiality and immateriality, as I, I have shown. So um, actually Derrida tries to uh, criticize this ideology and actually to, uh, to uh, uh, change uh, logos with writing. So all the theory of écriture, of writing uh, developed by uh, Derrida was uh, a critic of uh, this ideology of uh, immateriality. But at the same time, however, it has never uh, uh, really been outdated, the, this kind of dualistic uh, approaches. Um, it is still there, and perhaps also in the work uh, in the works of those who have tried hardest to criticize it, to criticize it. and if you think about Derrida, actually uh, he himself uh, ends up replacing the concept of logos with a rather immaterial idea of writing and text. At least, I'm not sure about uh, uh, Derrida's work, but uh, if you think about Derrida's uh, doxa, so the reception of Derrida's work, actually the idea of text which, uh, which emerges from this kind of theory is quite immaterial. Everything is text, there's nothing outside text, il n'y a pas de hors text, um, and then all the work about intertextualities by Kristeva, for example, actually, uh, and, and Derrida explaining that uh, uh, text is not books, uh, so text is not actually material, is uh, uh, itself something which escape to the to the uh, uh, to the material uh, word. Uh, word. Um, so I, I repeat, it's not uh, uh, what Derrida says, but it's how uh, some of his thinking has been uh, interpreted and reused uh, after him. And uh, in a, a kind of a post-structuralist uh, uh, doxa, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, idea of text is quite um, immaterial. So, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, I just cite the La Pharmacie de Platon, and then the next one uh, where we come to uh, Karen Barrad. You can see uh, Karen Barrad on the slide. And the uh, next one, um, uh, please. So. Uh, the the renewed interest in materiality. So I'm not I'm not the only one interested in materiality here. Uh, actually, um, uh, there are many many works today uh, working on this topic, and um, so it's what has been called the new materialism, uh, new materialisms or new materialism wave. Uh, so it it seems to promise different paths. One must think about the materiality of writing, or better, thinking is only this materiality, as I was saying at the beginning of the lecture. So there are many forms uh, of uh, uh, new materialism. Uh, please, uh, next slide, I just show a paper um, by Gamble, uh, Hannah and Nail, uh, what is new materialism, which is uh, um, an état de l'art, so it explains uh, um, uh, all the kinds of of new materialism, and actually I quite agree with uh, their analysis because they say uh, that uh, Karen, ba Karen Barad approach uh, is, uh, is uh, the most interesting one. So I, I completely agree with, uh, with this analysis. Um, so there are many forms of new materialism, uh, but I agree with, uh, with Gamble, uh, Hannah and Nail to think that Karen Barad is the most interesting and most developed form of it. In order to understand the depth of Barrett's proposal, it is useful uh, to look at uh, a physical experiment uh, imaged by Bohr. So um, 
Karen Barrad at the beginning uh, he's uh, a uh, physicist and uh, and uh, uh, a quantum physicist uh, this is a uh, first uh, uh, specialization um, and uh, and then uh, she, uh, she is I, I think she goes like it's they uh, they uh, uh, they think that uh, that uh, uh, they are a, a philosopher um, after physicists so uh, this is a very interesting uh, um, experience Experiment that uh, Barrett explained. So Barrett takes uh, the uh, the philosophy of Bohr, the what uh, they call um, philosophy physics of Bohr, um, and uh, analyze it in order to explain this very relationship between uh, between mat matter and meaning. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, what uh, uh, leads her to say matter matters and to explain it. So uh, I, I uh, beg your pardon for this uh, uh, long parenthesis that I will do uh, about uh, something uh, which I'm not a uh, specialist of at all. So I hope I won't uh, say uh, uh, crazy and foolish things. Um, so it's, uh, it's uh, um, a parenthesis parentheses based on the work of, of Karen Barrett, so I'm explaining uh, uh, their thought. Uh, it's not mine, it's not my interpretation of quantum physics. I won't be able to do that. It's Karen Barrett's. So, next slide, uh, please. So, um, all starts with uh, this uh, very famous uh, double slit experiment. Next slide, which was uh, uh, realized for the first time in uh, 1801 uh, by Thomas Jung. Uh, the idea of the experiment is to answer a very simple, apparently, question uh, Is the light a wave or a set of particles? So, um, the experiment is actually used to determine whether the phenomenon being analyzed is a wave or a particle, and uh, was so. So Young uh, 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 used it to demonstrate that light behaves like a wave. So the experiment consists in sending a beam of light to a support with two slits, as you can see in the picture. I guess that in the next slide, if you can change it, uh, yes, you can see it uh, uh, better. So uh, now, uh, let's imagine what happens uh, if we throw um, against these, uh, these two slits uh, something like uh, uh, some baseballs. Uh, so we we uh, expect uh, that uh, we will find so some balls will uh, will pass through the uh, one slit and some balls to the other one and so we we expect to find in the in the screen behind these two slits um, two uh, two lines where uh, the the uh, we will find uh, the the most important distributions of uh, distribution of uh, uh, balls so this is what uh, we expect if uh, if uh, 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 we uh, deal with uh, um, with the particles, so, so with something like a ball. Next slide. So if uh, uh, we throw something different, for example, a light source, but let's imagine we throw waves, uh, water waves. So what we expect that, uh, as you can see in the picture, uh, we expect that uh, some waves pass through one slit, some other with uh, from the other, and actually we they will interfere uh, uh, the one uh, with the other, and they will produce what you can see here an inter in interference pattern. Uh, next slide, uh, you can see how it works uh, uh, in uh, in uh, with water. So this is what you see if you produce two waves, uh, and uh, and you uh, these two waves are uh, interfering uh, um, one uh, each other. So um, what uh, what uh, happens? Uh, this is the interesting point. So this. Jung tried it with light, and actually he, he, it shows that uh, uh, light uh, behaves like a wave. So you can see the interference uh, pattern um, after that. So, um, however, if we carry out the experiment by throwing electrons against uh, the two slits, the result is really, I mean, I wrote surprising, but it's, cra it's crazy, it's really crazy. So the electrons, uh, which would seem to be similar to small balls, uh, so little particles, do not behave like particles, but like waves, and they produce an inter interference 
atom. It seems that electrons interfere with, with each other. So let's try to, to understand what, uh, what uh, uh, is going on. So uh, we can find a trick. I guess uh, you can put uh, on the next slide. <clears throat> Yes, so we can find the trick, and this is the trick imagined by, uh, by Bohr. We can throw the electrons one by one first, thus preventing them from interacting with each other. So they tried also to send them one, then wait a week and send another one. So in order to be sure that there is no possible interference. But again, the final results are surprising. Each electron arrives, in fact, at a precise, a precise point of the screen, as expected. But if we look at the pattern produced at the end, after having launched separately all the electrons and at an important distance of time between one another, we find an interference pattern. So it's uh, like crazy. Since the electrons are thrown one by one, they cannot interfere with each other. So it's impossible. So it seems... Uh, that they interfere with themselves. So it seems that each electron passes through both slits and interferes with itself, which is crazy, but uh, okay, uh, let's, let's imagine that, what, what we can do. These are the results. So uh, little, little uh, uh, parenthesis, this experiment uh, was uh, first a Gedanken experiment. Uh, so just imagined by Bohr, and it was realized uh, so uh, during the, the 20s, I think. And it was realized because uh, at the time of Bohr, it was not possible. They, uh, they didn't have the technology to do that. But it was realized and it, gave, it gives exactly the results expected by Bohr uh, during the 90s. So this is interesting. So to verify this strange idea, one electron interfering with uh, itself, we can modify the device. So as you see in the picture on the uh, uh, right, uh, this was the idea of uh, of uh, Bohr um, in such a way that we are able to observe through which slit an electron passes. So the idea is a which path experiment. So we have to modify the device which we have uh, uh, made to observe uh, this phenomenon because uh, in the first device we were not able to establish from which path the electrons pass. So we have to modify, this is very important. So we have to modify uh, 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 slightly, so in a very little way, just in order to be able, you can uh, think about it like, uh, okay, put an eye on the slit and just observe where it passes. And so we modify a little bit the, the device in order to be able to measure from which path, path the electron pass. And the experiment is identical to the previous to the previous one, except for this little detail. And still a surprising result awaits us, the interference pattern disappears. So we just did the same thing, but at the end, the electron is behaving like a particle. Why that? Next slide, please. So, that what Bohr, uh, uh, what Karen Barrad says. Bohr argued that if we were to perform a two-slit experiment with a which path device, which, what what I, I, I uh, just explained, which can be used to determine which slit each electron goes through on its way to the detecting screen, we would find that the, that the interference pattern is destroyed. That is, if a measurement is made that identifies that electron is as a particle, as it is the case when we use the which part detector, then the result will be a particle pattern, not the wave pattern that results when the original unmodified two slits apparatus is used. So next slide, please. What is the conclusion about that? Uh, so there are many discussion about, uh, is this an epistemological problem or an ontological problem? Is this a problem uh, about our way of, of knowing the world or is it a problem about the world itself? So Bohr and Barrett uh, think that uh, there is, the world is made like that. So it's ontological. Uh, it's the difference between the indeterminacy principle um, uh, stated by, by 
bar and uh, and uh, uh, the the principle as uh, it is uh, understood by uh, um, uh, by Eisenberg uh, who thinks that it's just that we cannot uh, see it uh, so it's just epistemological so um the the conclusion Barr's conclusion and Barrett's conclusion is that the concept of particle and the concept of wave do not exist outside specific apparatuses which allowed to understand them. So there is no particle in the universe. There is a particular setting which makes it possible to think the concept of a, of a wave or the concept of particle. So the electron isn't a particle and it isn't a wave. The phenomenon of the electron passing in a which path apparatus is a particle and an electron passing in a non which apparatus is a wave. So uh, actually there is not something like concepts and then specific physical arrangements uh, that are able to grasp them. Actually concepts are specific physical arrangements. So next uh, uh, slide, please. So uh, uh, what uh, uh, Barrett states is Barr's argument for the indeterminable nature of measurement interactions is based on his insight that concepts are defined by the circumstances, so the material circumstances required for the measurement. That is, theoretical concepts, theoretical is important here, are not ideational in character. They are specific physical arrangement. That is the point that I wanted to make with this uh, uh, quantum mechanics uh, parenthesis. I hope it is clear and I think it's very important to, uh, to, un to underline that uh, um, according to Barrad and to Bohr, it is an ontological question. So it's not that we cannot understand some concepts uh, outside some specific uh, physical arrangements. Concepts does, do not exist outside, uh, outside specific physical, so material, arrangements. Concepts are, are not just conditioned by, as I was saying at the beginning of this lecture, so it's not just that our thinking is conditioned by the environment where it emerges, our thinking is the specific <laughs> physical arrangements where it takes place. So now, uh, I'm not thinking actually. Uh, I'm uh, what, what, what the, the meaning which emerges during this lecture is the result of a specific physical arrangement in which there are people, there are protocols, algorithms, uh, WebEx uh, playing uh, in it, and uh, uh, places and stuff like that. And uh, and the meaning uh, emerging from this lecture is not my thought, like Plotinus uh, was uh, was uh, uh, thinking. So I thought the concepts here and then I deliver it to, to you with a delivery channel which is uh, neutral and not important. No, it's not at all like that. My thinking didn't exist without this specific arrangement. Uh, next slide, please. Let uh, So this it's what uh, uh, leads um, Karen Barra to say matter matters. So it matters in the in the sense that it produces meaning. Meaning is the result of matter. Meaning is matter. There's no meaning outside of matter. There is nothing which matters more than matter. Matter, it's all that matters. So that, that's the point. And next slide. And uh, um, I, I didn't uh, talk about writing for now, so I want to talk about it uh, uh, a little bit. <laughs> um, so what about writing as, okay, it's a, uh, Writing is one, uh, we can focus on some particular physical arrangements. The problem is, and Barad uh, is a, a aware of that, that uh, uh, actually, where does the physical apparatus end? end? I mean, okay, uh, uh, in order for a concept to, uh, to emerge, there are many things involved. 
like I was saying uh, uh, before. So here we have uh, protocols, we have uh, uh, we have WebEx, uh, we have a connection which doesn't work very well at the University of Montreal. Uh, we have the University of Montreal. We have uh, Jens and Marie Christine and and uh, me and uh, uh, atoms and protons and stuff like that. So uh, uh, and uh, and writings actually texts. There is Karen Barat book which has an important role in all of that. There are experiments and so where where does it stop? So uh, actually it doesn't. Uh, we just have to focus on something and uh, in order to for concepts to emerge we have to uh, to uh, uh, look to focus on a specific uh, defined um, um, physical arrangement. So now we can focus on writing as uh, have some specific uh, environments, some specific uh, physical and material arrangements from which <coughs> thought and thinking can emerge. So writing, what's writing? So everything is about, uh, uh, we can identify something which we can name tools, uh, protocols, um, so way of using, way of doing things, uh, algorithms, formats, uh, formats like uh, um, text formats, for example, and say that all these things actually think. Uh, they, I underline again, they do not just condition the thinking, they are thinking. So how do they think and what uh, do they uh, think? So they have the same characteristic uh, um, that that uh, uh, rely um, electrons with uh, with uh, the apparatus that uh, we have seen uh, before. So um, some particular device, uh, a Git repository, um, HTML uh, or DocX. Uh, TCP, IP, HTTP, uh, Markdown, TXT, um, syntax rules in different languages, tools and algorithms. What I'm saying now and what is written in a text that I'm looking at, so all these things are the material arrangements which produces thinking. So let's focus on one particular uh, um, uh, arrangement, physical arrangement that produces writing, which is uh, very central in our world. Uh, very sad about that, but it's uh, like that. So next slide, please. And uh, uh, um, this is word. So um, Marie Christine told that uh, we 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 uh, had a discussion about uh, proprietary uh, software and uh, and free software. So this is one point. So if if physical arrangements think, uh, actually it is important to know who owns <laughs> these, uh, these uh, specific arrangements. So this is one point about, uh, about uh, Word. So it is proprietary, but it's not the, the only one. Uh, next slide, please. Um, many works have been done on, on Word. Um, I just cite uh, Two of them, um, a, a blog post which is very, very interesting, but in French, um, Anfini Havec Word, which, uh, which uh, uh, tells the history of uh, how it was developed and why and so on. And then uh, a very uh, well known text by, by Kirschenbaum, uh, Track Changes, uh, which is uh, a, 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 a literary history of word processing. So he analyzes how uh, the, uh, this particular word proce uh, processor was used used in literature by, uh, by author in literature and how it, uh, it uh, uh, condition, this is what uh, Kirschenbaum says, um, uh, literary practices. So this is an important thing. So uh, next slide, please. And uh, just in order to understand how word thinks, um, we can do a little and very brief uh, history of, right, of, of uh, word processors. Uh, starting, so, what is very strange at the beginning is that uh, uh, actually computers are not made for writing. Computer, as the word says, are made for computing. So why do you want to write with uh, with uh, something which is made for may, may making calculations? So uh, this was a very strange idea. Actually, you 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 don't you don't write with uh, with uh, something which is made 
in order to, to compute. So at the beginning, what you write on a computer was code. But actually, uh, writing code presupposes another important practices, practice, uh, which is uh, document it. So you write the code and then you document it. And at the beginning, uh, uh, the coders uh, um, uh, used to write the code on the computer. And uh, at the side, they had a typewriter where they type they type the, the, the documentation. Because the idea is uh, was that uh, the documentation should be printed and uh, readable, and you don't read uh, on a computer uh, with very, very tiny screens, uh, black and uh, difficult to see and so on. So you, you, you need paper. So at the beginning, uh, so 1976, uh, Michael Schreyer, that you can see uh, in the picture, um, developed electric pencil. The idea was you have uh, uh, an environment where you can write code and then write the documentation and then print it. 79 Easy Writer, developed by uh, a very interesting uh, uh, person, uh, so John Thomas Draper, alias uh, Captain Crunch, because uh, he was in prison actually when he developed uh, uh, Easy Writer uh, because uh, uh, of phone hacking. He used uh, the whistle that you can find in the in the Crunch serial uh, in order to uh, to have uh, free phone calls because uh, the, the tone of the whistle uh, enables to uh, to uh, uh, become administrator of the phone, so you you can phone. Uh, so this is very interesting because uh, hacking is trying to understand what are the uh, what are the principles that make something working so what is the world vision that is behind so how it works means uh, what what kind of theoretical principles are behind it? So there, it, it is a theoretical analysis, actually, if you think about uh, Bohr and uh, his, uh, his uh, Gedanken experiments, uh, it's the same thing. So uh, uh, Easy Writer was, was the second one, and then Wordstar, uh, some of you, the older one, uh, will probably uh, remember uh, Wordstar, uh, 79, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, Wordstar was, was very important because uh, it implemented something which was crazy before, the concept of page, which is completely unuseful in, uh, in uh, a digital en uh, environment, but remember, this was made for printing. So for home computers, I, I put a, a date there. It's not, there's not a date for home computers uh, and it's mostly the 70s, uh, not the 80s. But uh, 1984, as you know, is uh, the year of the very famous uh, uh, Apple advertising, um, which can, I mean, uh, 84 is a year very important because uh, many, many uh, home uh, started buying computers. So computers uh, come in the houses and uh, people begin to realize, okay, I can write with that. Th th this is not a crazy idea. Actually, you can write with that. And 83 is the, uh, the uh, date uh, word was launched in the market. So um, <clears throat> this is important in order to understand how it was developed. So uh, please, next slide. Um, what are the principles? Uh, here you can see uh, just uh, a, uh, an unzip of uh, a Word document uh, where the, the, the little uh, red uh, sign marks, uh, uh, it was a document uh, uh, made by uh, Antoine uh, Fauché, uh, by the way, who is uh, uh, um, uh, working with me. And uh, actually he just wrote on the document, Bonjour. And these are four of the many documents produced by, uh, by uh, Word. So what's the principle behind that? What is the Word view produced by Word? Uh, what's, what's Word thinking? Next slide, please. So uh, the important thing to, uh, to understand and to stress is that Word was basically thought for office work. So this is the important point. So. It is used to write <coughs> reports, internal office documents, letters. The format letter uh, is important here. All these documents are obviously not designed to be published. So it's not, it's not an issue. So it is linked with this history of printing. Why? Because we need to read it immediately. So it's just an internal uh, piece of document that we need to be able to read. And we don't have screen to read. So it's not, it's not that uh, easy to read on screen. So we need to print it. 
So all these documents are meant to be internal, but they must be printed so that co-workers can read them. So we are thinking to office work and we are thinking to specific sets of, uh, of uh, work, of office work. So we have uh, um, some people working in the same office and they have to share information. And so they need to, they, they used to have secretaries uh, typing this information uh, and then this information is available like that. But actually we can use a computer to do exactly the same thing. So the graphic interface is important because it should reproduce exactly the format that we are using for that particular purpose. But this, this format comes from the typewriter and from other, uh, um, other uh, constraints that don't exist anymore. But because we are copying this model, we reproduce them. So the, the idea of page, for example. So printing is always the goal. The office is the point. Uh, and uh, another interesting thing is uh, the relationship, so the identity between format in this case, doc at the beginning and then doc X uh, 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 after the, the huge pressure of the community because doc was, uh, was, uh, was a binary format, so it was uh, impossible to read outside the world. But so they, they uh, um, shift to doc X, which is an XML uh, um, uh, format, uh, which make it possible uh, for other uh, word processors to read the, the format. But actually, the idea is there is an identity between the format and a software, so Word and doc X, uh, where actually normally it's not the case so you have a format and then you can have uh, uh, whatever tool you like uh, it's wonderful yes the next slide is perfect uh, I, I i should go a little uh, quicker because we lost some time and uh, i'll try to uh, end in 10 minutes is it okay gents uh, jens uh, okay wonderful 10 minutes so so uh, what are the effects of uh, of uh, uh, this uh, uh, these ideas so the first one next slide the principle of what you see is what you get. And uh, uh, this idea of disintermediation, which, uh, which is a fake idea. So you have the feeling there's no intermediate between uh, you writing and the final result because you can see it. But actually there are many uh, uh, um, mediations. Uh, the mediation of the format, the mediation of the software, the mediation of the, the paper format, which is chosen and uh, which is recommended uh, pass passively, but actually uh, uh, recommended by the, uh, the uh, uh, software. So, um, and this principle of VisiWig determines a confusion between structuring and formatting. To facilitate the reading and processing of an article or a book, it is necessary to dissociate the semantic value of the fragments from their graphic rendering. For example, a level two title and uh, its graphic rendering in a large font size. So what does uh, WYSIWYG is that there is a confusion between structuring, semantically structuring a content and formatting graphically formatting, which was okay in the typewriter environment because formatting was the only way to structure, but which is kind of crazy in, uh, in a digital environment where formatting is not at all uh, uh, structuring. So you can structure with some, uh, some uh, um, uh, markup, you can structure the content, and then you can care. We, you can uh, care after how this uh, this structure is formatted, and so how it is graphically uh, rendered. So th the second, uh, this, this is the, the the first thing. And so you know, it's not uh, it's not bad uh, in itself. Uh, it's bad uh, according to what you want to do with it. So what are what are we doing when we write? When we write, what are we writing? This this is the point. So second point. The syntax is hidden. It is thus impossible to know what is going on. The, soft, the software decides about the meaning. And that's what you have seen in the, in the picture with all the files Word produces. So it produces a lot of stuff, a lot of text, a lot of meaning, but actually this meaning, we, we, don't, we, we know nothing about that. We don't know anything about that. It is produced by the software. So, uh, 
this have many many um, uh, little determines many many little glitches also that are not the most important thing but they are there uh, for example if you format something and then you delete it uh, you can leave uh, a blank space with the formatting and uh, you cannot see it it's impossible to change it because actually you don't see it so there is some syntax which is in hidden and impossible to change this is why at the end a, a docx file uh, bugs because uh, there are many there, there is many information which is not used that you can you are not able to manage and, and to see and to change so this is the other problem the docx format does not allow so the third point the docx format does not allow a scientific structuring of contents so if you want to write papers scientific papers words is kind of the worst tool ever because actually it's not conceived for that so the contents produced in docx are poorly marked up and difficult to access as they are poorly indexed indexed so at the time where there is a huge production of text it becomes crucial that documents are correctly structured to improve their indexing and to allow their query by advanced search tools and we are not thinking about that so words is producing the meaning of the future on some basis which we don't share actually as academics. Now I'm, I'm talking about academic writing. So the problem is not word. The problem is that there is an incompatibility between the, the word views that stands behind our work as academics and uh, the word view, which is produced by, by word. So editors, uh, uh, four point editor editors are obliged to do a long and tedious work of uh, reworking text in order to reintroduce uh, um, semantic layer and to correct the numerous and uh, uh, errors introduced by these word processors. So uh, the, 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 there is we make the work as editors, we make uh, and publishers, we make the work uh, um, many many times, and actually we completely lost the uh, uh, lose the link between uh, the initial writing and the final meaning uh, because it it's lost in translation actually in it's lost in the uh, specific environment which does not allow to to take track of uh, of the initial meaning so the struct the, the the scientific structure of thinking at the beginning cannot be implemented in the format so it just doesn't exist as uh, the electron which cannot be a particle uh, if you don't have a which path device it's the same thing so the durability of documents in docx format depends on on, on microsoft's willingness to maintain this uh, the, the, the the proprietary format the, this is another uh, thing um so however durability is not the mission and priority of a company so uh, um there is no guarantee that content in docx format will be accessible in the future and that you know it if you used to write with uh, Wordstar uh, during the 90s, uh, actually, all my stuff written in, uh, in Wordstar is not accessible anymore. And I mean, I, uh, I've written it uh, uh, 25 years ago, not, not uh, a century ago. Uh, so we can read Aristotle, but we cannot read something we wrote uh, uh, 25 years ago. So, but the most serious problem the most serious thing here is that writing and thinking become a single homogeneous activity. We all think the same way. The problem is not only how word thinks, it's that there is just word which thinks. There are not any, any other models. We are, every one of us, not everyone, but most of us, are using that, so there is only one way of thinking. So, and actually not only we are all using it, but we are all using it for all the activities possible. We are using it to, so, so in, in, uh, we think the same way in all our activities, activities, whether we are writing a love letter, a shopping list, a scientific paper uh, in physics or in literature, in literature, a novel uh, or some, some notes uh, during a lecture or during a class. Actually, we think 
in the same way for all these activities, which was not the case in the paper model because uh, there were uh, different uh, specific uh, material arrangements according to the activities. You don't write a shopping list in the same way you write a, um, a scientific paper when you are on paper. Uh, so before, before uh, Word and before the computer. So next one, uh, uh, please. So what I, I uh, uh, propose is that uh, we should think each time before starting to write to create our own writing environment. And this not once for all, but each time that we start writing. Here in the background of the slide, you can see uh, a specific uh, um, uh, writing arrangements that I produced for a particular project which name is Metontology uh, toward prehuman thinking uh, uh, on which I'm working on. And actually I, I create the format, I, uh, uh, so, uh, um, uh, so the idea is to make the text I write uh, interact with a series of sources. So I tried to imagine a data structure to allow this dialogue. So uh, classic sources, for example, Aristotle or, or Plato or whatever, and then uh, the text I write and each source. So what I needed uh, from each source uh, determined, has determined the, the format I use to uh, to structure this source. So I use uh, um, uh, YAML, uh, which is just a simple metadata format, and I structure the data in uh, some uh, ways. So each source, uh, each quotation is written in YAML, and it is accompanied by a series of metadata like the author's date of birth, the title, and the author's uh, uh, place of birth. This then allows me to see what I'm quoting, and uh, I use the Jupyter Notebook, uh, uh, for example, to visualize uh, my sources on a map based on the birthplace um, of uh, each author. And this allowed me to see how Eurocentric I was. And so it changed the way I looked for references saying, OK, I, I, I shouldn't be there. Actually, the, the possibility, the structure of the data and the format of the data changed my readings and so changed completely the text. Uh, so um, this, this is the, the format is the thinking. So here I use Zotero and then I use the HTML output and then I use the uh, 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 I am Vim uh, to uh, to write because I like it and because it uh, it uh, um, uh, implies some particular way of writing and thinking. And then I use uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks in order to uh, to uh, visualize some data I produced writing um, when I was writing and so on. So and this is so what I I I think it's important is each time we should create a particular writing environment. It can be very simple. For example. It can be just a piece of paper and the, and the, and the, uh, and the pen. I mean, this is a wonderful way of writing, and I can organize my my uh, piece of papers in some way that uh, they help uh, my what what I want uh, uh, my thinking to be. So this is uh, uh, the point. Uh, next slide, and I finish very uh, quickly now. Uh, so we tried to implement uh, uh, this a particular idea. I don't uh, I don't think it is the only one, but what we try to do with Stylo, so this is, you can use it at uh, uh, this um, this uh, URL, um, it's a free um, online text editor, and uh, it's an editor conceived in order to write papers in human science. So the idea was trying to implement a particular way of writing, a particular way of, of uh, uh, thinking. So um, not a general universal model, as word would want to be, uh, but a model answering uh, a very particular need, and uh, I sh should add this particular need, which is expressed by me and my team. I mean, so it's not universal. Probably uh, Jens writes in another way, and actually, to be quite frank, I don't use Stylo because it it does not it does not correspond exactly to what. Uh, I want to do, uh, but I mean, we try to to uh, to uh, build it uh, like uh, uh, in order to uh, represent, to make it possible, like the the which path apparatus, to make it possible a particular way of writing papers in human science. So uh, next slide, please. 
uh, what are the basic principles uh, of, uh, of Stylo? So to take advantage of the semantic skills of the author. The author, when he's writing, they are writing, actually they are, they, they know something about their text. They know, okay, this is a date, this is a name, this is an important name, this is a definition, this is a concept, this is an example, and so on. So they have uh, semantic skills about uh, the text and we want to take advantage of them. Uh, we want them to be able to express these competencies. So give the author back control over the structure and semantic of the text. And uh, we try to make an editor, next, uh, the next slide, which is at the same time simpler, so with a clear interface, with uh, fewer options, because Word has a lot of options, uh, which, uh, which determines the way we think with it. Um, so, and fewer features than than uh, than a word processing tool like uh, like uh, a word then next slide please and at the same time richer so the possible of marking up contents uh, la the possible of uh, uh, managing the bibliographic contents so using zofiro or other formats to manage structured uh, um, uh, bibliographic content which is very important uh, in human science i mean our science is a science about text so the the, 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 the uh, capability of citing this text in a correct way is uh, actually the strong part of our our scientificity uh, we are scientific because we are able to cite documents uh, we, uh, uh, humanities are science about text so about this kind of document. So um, um, expressing rich metadata and having at the end uh, multiple exports. And next slide. And uh, the uh, possibility of semantics. So the idea is not what you see is what you get, but what you see is what you mean. So putting the semantics before everything. Next uh, slide, please. And so um, it's a modular application here. I, I don't want to comment uh, on all of this because I'm. Uh, 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 it's a little late. Uh, but the idea is to use many different components um, and to to put them together uh, in order uh, for Stylo to be open. I mean, Stylo is not a format. Uh, Stylo is just a tool putting together a lot of standards that you can use in other environments in order to for for the uh, the, the writer, the author, to be able to shift from a writing environment to another, uh, getting the information, um, uh, getting the, the control of uh, the information. So I use Stylo, I share a paper with uh, uh, Mary Christine, and then I use it on Vim, and I use it on other uh, text editors, and then I use Zotero, and then I use LaTeX, and uh, never it's you can do whatever you want. So this kind of fluidity was an important thing for us, and the fact to not be obliged to maintain all these modules uh, because actually we are we are a, uh, a university lab so the perennity of our existence is uh, is not uh, assured so that that's the the presentation of of uh, stylo and the last uh, slides please uh, the the take uh, take away message is uh, by voltaire next slide and uh, the end of of uh, uh, candide so um, all this is very well answered candide but uh, let us call cultivate our garden and I think that's what it means to create its own writing, uh, our own uh, writing environment. Um, that uh, is what it means uh, to take care about specific um, uh, physical and material arrangements which, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, are our thinking. Thank you very much and excuse me, I was too long. Thank you very much indeed, um, Marcello. You were not too long at all, and um, it was uh, a sheer joy. Uh, thank you very much for this um, introduction, I think, to a lot of tools, a lot of sets of questions, I think, that at least um, were very, very enriching to me, listening to it, but also the build-up and your um, comments on materiality and questions that matter in our daily work, to use the one pun um, you have been making, um, but also the invitation to um, cultivation and gardening that matters in our, the, the world of tools that we are using. Very enriching, a lot of food for thought. And um, if you agree, I would probably would like to unshare 
the presentation real quick so we can maybe have a so we can have a better view um, uh, for everyone in the audience and maybe start transitioning um, our lecture part um, into a question and answer um, part, if that's all right with you. Um, and Marie-Christine and I, we, we thought, um, since you are, you know, um, part of a team and yourself also very, very much involved in developing some of those tools you mentioned, and you are also heavily using some of those tools, I was going to invite you, if you would like to elaborate on some of the tools you have been mentioning, um, and some of them you have been involved in developing them, like um, Stylo, but some others you have been mentioning were particularly in, uh, interesting to me personally, not having heard of them, at least myself, and sorry for my ignorance. But uh, VIM you have been mentioning, for example, Stylo, of course, which you have been involved in, and I guess it's more known, but um, YAML and others. I mean, maybe, for example, VIM, could you help us understand what you find particularly <laughs> interesting and helpful in using it, for example? And how does it how does it allow you to think, as you say, also outside of the not only conditions, right, uh, as you said, but the the sheer materiality of thinking that word would um, force you basically to to produce. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, actually, for, first of all. Um, I like very much to change um, environments, uh, to experiment with uh, uh, different environments. This is something I like very much. So I'm not stuck with uh, uh, one tool. Uh, it has been, I think, uh, three or four years uh, since I'm using uh, uh, Vim. Um, actually, it's uh, it's uh, a tool uh, which is made. Uh, so it's a very powerful text editor um, which uh, has no graphic interface. Um, so it's uh, you you cannot use the mouse. It's just the the, the keyboard, and uh, it's uh, highly customizable. So you can uh, uh, add plugins as you want, and you really can set up your environment as uh, you uh, uh, you like. So this is what I like very much. Is not uh, uh, to have the mouse. Uh, which is a way of stay focused on the keyboard and uh, which is a strange way of uh, of dealing with text just using text so when you change so you have uh, different modes in uh, in vim for example you have uh, uh, an insert mode so you can write and you have a visual mode you can select and copy and paste and actually in order to shift from this mode, you have to use letters. So you, you push on the I and uh, you uh, shift to the insert environment. Uh, you push on the uh, V and uh, you, you shift to the visual environment. So actually, uh, letters are at the same time a part of what you are writing and a part of your interaction with the text. So this is a very interesting way of writing for me. And actually, it is uh, the, the other point is that uh, you use it in a terminal. Uh, which allows you to see the text. Actually, I think to see the text, there are many other ways to do it. Uh, so uh, VS Codium, for example, uh, VS Codium uh, or, or whatever new uh, coding environment allows to have a terminal um, implemented in the in the environment but uh, what i like about uh, vim it uh, it is in the terminal so uh, there is a continuity between uh, writing and manipulating in a computational way your text so i'm able to shift from uh, writing uh, a, uh, something and then uh, to use it uh, in order to do something i use python because it's simple uh, and uh, and uh, I, I like it. Before I, I was, uh, another way is to using Bash, so just the the, the uh, base, basic terminal language in order to manipulate tests. So YAML is a way uh, of uh, of uh, uh, structuring metadata. So for example, it's a very simple syntax. So it's a format uh, allowing uh, uh, to structure data as you want, uh, just with a very, very simple key value structure. So for example, title, uh, the factory of thinking, uh, author, uh, Jens Kugel, uh, and then uh, date, uh, whatever, and so on. So, and what is interesting, it's, it's, it's very simple and you can imagine your own data structure 
uh, easily uh, adapting uh, uh, the syntax to your own needs. So if you need, uh, I don't know, birthplace, you just have to add the key. Uh, so it's text, uh, birthplace, um, two dots, um, and then you, you whatever you want. Uh, and this allow then, if you use uh, a basic parser, uh, like in Python, uh, you can use this data in order to to do whatever you want. Uh, actually, there is uh, one key um, tool that I, uh, I didn't talk about, but which is at, uh, uh, very important also for Stylo because we use it uh, for Stylo, is Pandoc. So what is very interesting about Pandoc is a text converter. Um, the idea is you can uh, uh, shift from uh, any format you want to any format you want. The two more important uh, format are the Markdown, which is a standard simplification of uh, HTML, and then HTML. But you can transform using Pandoc texts from Markdown to LaTeX, uh, to PDF, to DocX if uh, you really like it, and, uh, and so on. What is interesting about Pandoc that it, it, it was made by a, a guy who is professor of philosophy in a, in a U.S. university. So what is interesting is, so he writes the code. Uh, and it's very interesting that he completely fits my needs. And actually, I can see why. <laughs> I mean, it was produced by a guy who makes the same thing as, as I do. So it, it really is useful to me. And actually, it uses Markdown and YAML, for example, and other formats, but you can have your YAML. Uh, for example, the slides that you were sharing, my slides, are made um, in Markdown, and I have a little uh, YAML uh, at the beginning, and then I use Pandoc in order to produce a reveal.js framework, uh, which is an HTML, uh, so it's a, a JavaScript library um, able to, uh, to show slides in an HTML format. So, but I was using Vim and uh, uh, YAML, Markdown, and Pandoc in order to do that. So, uh, and this completely changed, actually, the idea of using the backgrounds, for example, of slides in this way uh, comes from uh, Reveal. Uh, .js, which allows this kind of, uh, of practice. So, uh, and actually my, my lecture was, and often my, my classes and uh, when I speak with slides uh, are very uh, structured on this particular way of writing slides. So, um, it's just a few uh, examples of tools, but I would say that, um, uh, so most important things in my way of writing, uh, what, uh, doesn't change that much are formats like Markdown, YAML, uh, and uh, the text converter like, uh, and BibTeX for, for uh, bibliography, and then a text converter like uh, Pandoc. And uh, starting fr from that, uh, then I use different kinds of environments uh, for specific projects, and uh, I, I adapt uh, my environments to specific needs or specific ambitions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the elaborations.